Hi everybody, welcome back. We are moving on to Brain Structures 2, the Cerebrum and the Diencephalon. If you haven't watched Brain Structures 1 about the brainstem, please go back and watch it and then return here. The cerebrum is the most conspicuous part of the brain and makes up about 90% of the mass of the brain. This is also where the centers that control speaking, memory, calculations, imagination, and planning are kept. On the surface of the cerebrum, you can see ridges and grooves. The grooves are called sulci, and the most prominent sulcus is the central sulcus, which separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. The ridges are called gyri, and the most prominent gyri are the precentral and postcentral gyri, also known as the primary motor cortex and the somatosensory cortex. The cerebrum also contains two fissures, deeper clefts that separate areas of the brain. The longitudinal fissure separates the left and the right hemisphere. The transverse fissure separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum. These fissures are lined by the dura mater. The outer layer of the cerebrum is called the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is a thin layer of gray matter overlaying white matter tracks. Many nuclei are found here. The brain contains five lobes, each separated by a sulci. The lobes are easy to remember because they mostly are under the cranial bones of the same name. The frontal lobe lies under the frontal bone and is separated from the parietal bone by the central sulcus. The frontal lobe contains the primary motor cortex which is in the precentral gyrus. The parietal lobe is found posterior to the frontal lobe and contains the somatosensory cortex located in the postcentral gyrus. The temporal lobe is found lateral to the parietal lobe under the temporal bone and the occipital lobe is found posterior to the others. The insula is deep to all other lobes and can only be seen by resecting back the temporal lobe. The white matter of the cerebrum lays under the cortex. You can think of it as the middle area of a brain sandwich, as it has gray matter superficial to it and another layer of gray matter deep. This area contains myelinated axons that run in three different types of tracts. Remember that a tract is a bundle of axons in the CNS. Association tracts carry axons within the same hemisphere, they don't cross over to the other side. Commissural tracts carry axons from the cerebral cortex on one side to the cerebral cortex in the other hemisphere, crossing over from one side to the other. An example of a commissural tract we have already learned about is the corpus callosum. Another example is the gray commissure of the spinal cord, where tracts cross from one side of the cord to the other. Projection tracts carry axons from the cerebrum to lower parts of the central nervous system, such as the thalamus, the brainstem, and the spinal cord. Deep to the cortex and white matter, there's more gray matter. Remember, gray matter is made up of cell bodies and dendrites, and a collection of cell bodies in the CNS is called a nuclei. This picture shows a frontal section of the brain. You should be able to recognize the cerebral cortex, the longitudinal fissure, and the lateral ventricles. Just lateral to the ventricles are the two lobes of the thalamus. The blue areas around these structures are called the basal nuclei. These areas function to receive input from the cerebral cortex and regulate initiation and termination of movements by refining the output to skeletal motor neurons. Disorders such as Parkinson's disease, where skeletal muscle contraction becomes uncontrolled, is thought to be due to dysfunction of the basal nuclei. In addition, obsessive compulsive disorder, schizophrenia, and chronic anxiety have been linked to improper signaling between the basal nuclei. Encircling the upper portion of the brain stem and the corpus callosum, the limbic system is a ring of structures on the inner border of the cerebrum, seen here in green. The limbic system is often called our emotional brain because it is involved with some of our strongest emotions, such as fear, pain, pleasure, 
docility, and anger. The olfactory bulbs are part of the limbic system, as well as the hippocampus, where we store our memories. In this way, the limbic system links smell and memory, which is why smelling a batch of cookies can cause you to experience a rush of emotion linked to previous memories. All sensory information is routed through the thalamus except for smell. This is because the olfactory bulbs of cranial nerve number one that carry the sensation of smell is linked to the limbic system. The hippocampus is also unique in that it is the only structure in the nervous system where cells undergo mitosis and divide. The amygdala is part of the limbic system along with the hypothalamus that seems to be involved in fear and rage responses. Stimulation of the amygdala results in aggressive behavior, while damage to this structure results in a loss of fear and aggression. Let's move on to brain structures three, the diencephalon. The diencephalon is shown here in purple. This is a structure deep within the cerebrum. It consists of the thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus, and is superior to the brainstem. In lab, we saw some of these structures on the sagittal brain model. You can identify the thalamus with the intermediate mass, the hypothalamus with its associated pituitary gland, and the epithalamus. We'll start with the thalamus. Remember from lab that the thalamus consists of two paired egg-shaped structures that are connected by the interthalamic adhesion. This connection is listed on your lab practical list as the intermediate mass, and sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the median commissure. You should know from the name commissure that there are tracks that can pass from one side of the thalamus to the other through here across the midline. The thalamus serves as the gateway to the cerebral cortex for all sensory information except for smell. The posterior column, medial limniscus pathway, brings sensory information to the thalamus. With all this incoming sensory information, the thalamus helps to prioritize what information is important and what can be ignored. The thalamus also helps to relay motor information going in the opposite direction, out from the motor cortex to the corticospinal tracts. The hypothalamus is located in the third ventricle, beneath the thalamus. It is connected to the pituitary gland via a short stalk called the infundibulum. It is an area with many nuclei and serves as the control center for many of the homeostatic loops in the body. Sensory input is received by the hypothalamus, for example, our somatic and visceral senses, as well as senses of vision, taste, and smell. The hypothalamus controls the set point for body temperature and activates the thirst and hunger centers. It also controls the autonomic nervous system, which regulates cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and the activities of many glands. Together with the limbic system, the hypothalamus is involved with some of our strongest emotions. It produces several hormones and controls and is connected to the pituitary gland, which makes many other hormones. It is involved with the regulation of circadian rhythms and sets your sleep and wake cycles. The epithalamus is an area posterior to the thalamus. It contains the pineal gland, which produces melatonin. Melatonin helps to induce sleep, and it is produced at greater amounts during the night and less during the day. Blue light, such as from artificial screens, destroy melatonin, which is why if you're looking at your phone at night, you might have trouble going to sleep. That's it for today. See you in class.